Welcome to System and Devices 1, Lecture 1, an introduction to the material we'll be covering in this module. My name's Michael Freeman, uh, my office is CSE 145, the email address mjf at cs.york.ac.uk, so if you have any questions, do drop me an email. Teaching material is available on the VLE, so these slides, practical scripts, exercise sheets, etc. There is also some additional material on my homepage, some background into the process that we'll be developing in this module. Normally I'd say pop round if you have any questions, but with COVID I don't think this would be possible, so do drop me an email and we can arrange a Zoom chat uh, to talk through any problems uh, that you may have. One thing to highlight about this module, it's a very hands-on practical module, so the background material we'll be looking at in the slides uh, is there to help you develop the skills you need uh, to answer the open assessment at the end of the course. So it's not important to memorise specific details about various machines or dates, etc. It's only there to get that hands-on skill. As always, the aims of any of the modules you'll be taking are available on the module descriptor page. Do have a look. Uh, these will list the learning outcomes for each module and when the assessments are. So System Devices 1 is a fundamental computer architectures course where we look at what's inside a computer. So we look at the key architectural components of any computer, so the processor, memory and its buses, and see how they can be linked together in different ways to form different computer architectures. Uh, for those who've done A-level before, this, some of this will be familiar, but we do go into a little bit more detail than perhaps you're used to. Another aim of this module is to look at how those high-level programming languages you're used to, uh, so your, perhaps your Java and your Python or your C, is broken down into the lower-level languages that actually run on that processor. So look at how they are translated uh, down into the assembler code and the machine code that runs on the actual processor. The module is structured using a bottom up approach. The first thing we look at are those fundamental transistors, at the building block of any computer. Then we see how those transistors can be grouped together to form individual logic gates, and then how those logic gates can be used to build higher level components. So if you are adders and registers, for example, and then how we can combine those adders and registers to form a counter, which is the heart of a state machine, the fundamental building block of your computer. Now, there's lots of different ways that this module could be taught, but I'm a great believer that you don't truly understand something until you can build it yourself. So we're going to follow the device of John Dewey. He was an re educational researcher, and his key philosophy was that education is not just telling people facts. You have to allow students to get hands-on and experience the problems for themselves. Uh, telling them is just not enough. Therefore, over a series of lecture and labs, you, you will be building your own computer, writing your own assembler. And that's the only way you start to understand why a computer architecture looks like the way it does. So the first computer we were building is one I designed a few years ago, the Simple CPU version 1A. Uh, this is a very simple computer. It's an accumulator-based architecture, which means that all operations are based around a single data register, the accumulator. Uh, this is a common architecture you'd see in first-generation computers. Uh, so computer architectures are classified by their, their technologies that they use. So you've got first, second, third, and fourth generation. So first generation were valve-based uh, computers. Then you have second generation with transistors, discrete transistor computers. Third generation were integrated circuits, uh, so the computer was broken down into a series of ICs, integrated circuits, so the, uh, the processor itself would be spread over multiple PCBs, printed circuit boards, uh, that was third generation. And then fourth generation, where we live today, where your processor is a single VLSI chip, so VLSI, very large scale integration, uh, IC, integrated circuit. So you may ask, well, well, if we live in the land of fourth generation, why are we looking at a first generation computer? Well, it's to introduce the fundamental ideas. Uh, computers have changed a lot over the time, obviously, from the 1940s to the present day. Uh, but fundamentally, they're very similar. Um, so if you look at a computer from the 1940s, it still processes instructions as we do today. Obviously, today's machines are highly optimised to get the, the most uh, processing power possible out of uh, the hardware we use. Uh, but they still process instructions, so they still have to do that fetch, decode, execute cycle. So starting with a simple machine like the simple CPU allows you to see the fundamentals of what's happening inside the processor and allows you to build your own computer. So if you'd like some more information about the simple CPU, uh, there's a web page for that. Uh, so if you go to my homepage. You'll find a link to my uh, Simple CPU page. Uh, there's Bob. Uh, you'll be catching Bob in trap later. Uh, and the Simple CPU version 1 is that one there. So if you follow that link, that will take you to a web page. We'll talk to you if you had this process of design from the fundamental logic gates all the way up to a program that prints ooh, Hello World to the screen. So we'll be looking at this architecture over a series of lectures. Uh, so we'll be looking at that accumulator, the arithmetic and logic unit, the instruction register, uh, program counter, control logic, external memory you see here, so that we get a good understanding of what all these fundamental components do do, and then we'll program it to, to control some hardware in the real world. 
but you'll soon find out that this processor has some fundamental flaws. It has some limitations. Now we can overcome those with some dubious programming techniques of, uh, such as self-modifying code, uh, which we'll cover later, but we will continue to refine this architecture and we'll eventually get to the simple CPU version 1D, which will allow us to do uh, the types of programming tasks that we want to do. So the block diagram you see here that defines the simple CPU version 1A's architecture can be implemented in different technologies. And as a general rule, uh, an architecture is independent of its technology. So we could take this architecture and implement it as a valve machine if we wanted to, or in, in transistors. Uh, the first one I did uh, was a breadboarded version. So here's our processor implemented on breadboard. So this shows one particular implementation of that architecture. So to dive down into a little bit of technical detail, this process has an 8-bit address bus, a 16-bit data bus, uh, an 8-bit accumulator, that internal register, data register, uh, an 8-bit ALU, so it processes 8-bit numbers, uh, so we can do add, subtract, and logical bitwise ands, and that's all the processing it can do. Uh, it has 10 instructions, two addressing modes, so two ways of getting its data, and using this very simple instruction set, we can actually do some processing. So again, if you'd like some more information about this particular implementation, you can go to my webpage and you'll find a link on this web page, I talk through how this machine was built, but there are also some videos of it actually in action, so you can see it working. So this first video here is the machine running its initial test program. So in the video, I'm resetting the processor, uh, it's starting to run that test program, and, the, and what the test program does is it exercises all the functional blocks to make sure they're working correctly. So you can see lots of flashing LEDs as it does that. Uh, in the actual uh, implementation down the bottom here, we have the accumulator, so our general purpose data register. Uh, we have an address bus, uh, we have the data bus, some instruction decode signals. Uh, this flashing LED here is the clock, so every time it flashes, it's doing one internal step inside the processor and some internal uh, control signals that indicate the fetch decode execute cycle. Now, I'm just going to pause this one here. I know I've gone into a lot of detail here, and we will be going through all of that in more detail in, in later lectures, but it's just to show the machine being broken down into its various blocks and the things that you need to consider. So down the bottom here, we have the accumulator, that data register, and that is split between different ICs. Now, those ICs store the data I want to process, and it needs to move that data in and out of external memory, and external memory is over here. So you can see the link between the accumulator, my internal register, and the external uh, memory is via all these wires, and they implement the data bus. It allows me to transfer the, the information from one storage element to, the, to another uh, down these individual wires. So you can start to see all the basic building blocks inside that processor, which is sometimes lost in a block diagram. So a couple of key points to remember here. Uh, sometimes a computer architecture looks the way it does, not because the designer wanted to do it that way, but the limitations of the chipsets he was using. So, for example, the accumulator here was spread across three ICs, not because I wanted to, but it's just the limitations of the technology I was using. Uh, a second point is communication, uh, sometimes a very much overlooked uh, part of a system. So how you represent your data in your system and then how you communicate that across the various data buses and the wires in your system has a significant impact on the system performance. So never underestimate the delays associated with communications within the system. It's surprising how much time a process just sits there waiting for data. And to, some, uh, and to some degree, you can see that when you look at this uh, breadboard implementation. When you just look at this system, you can see that quite a lot of it is just made up of wires. The communication links that I need to link the various functional units together. Uh, and obviously all of these have communication delays associated with them, slowing down our system. So using this machine, we can actually do some processing. So if you scroll down here, you'll find a link to the display and this processor has a LCD display, so a liquid crystal display. And using this processor, we can actually print messages onto that screen. On the web page, there's another video of the processor running a Hello World program where it prints Hello World to an LCD display. Now that'll take a few seconds to do because the processor is running uh, internally at one hertz. That means it does effectively one instruction every second or so which is very slow, obviously. Obviously, a modern processor is running in the gigahertz, so it's many millions of instructions uh, per second, uh, so thousands of millions of instructions per second. Uh, the reason why this processor is obviously running so slowly is, one, because of its implementation. It's uh, implemented on breadboard, uh, so it's, it's quite a noisy environment, electrically speaking. So the faster you run it, the more likely the signals will get corrupted. And another reason is we want to slow it down so we can see the internal steps happening. We want to see those LEDs flashing. Obviously, the faster we would have the machine running, uh, the quicker those LEDs would flash uh, and they'd just become a blur eventually. But you can see now, after about a minute or so, it started to print out the, 
the Hello World message. So initially the program initializes the uh, LCD display, so sets it up to how it's gonna print those characters. Then it has to read those characters out of memory. Uh, we're representing obviously that, that information as ASCII characters. Uh, and then we need to process that, send that to the LCD display to print it on the screen. So eventually, after a few minutes, uh, we will get the message appearing. And obviously, when you normally print Hello World to the screen, it's obviously instantaneously because the process is running so quickly. But this one is a slightly more slower machine. So in this module, you could build this processor on breadboard as shown here. And the advantage of that is you would know what every single wire does on that processor so you truly understand how it does work. But the disadvantage of that is that it only takes one wire to be put in the wrong place and the whole machine will stop working. So debugging uh, this implementation is quite tricky to be honest. Uh, so therefore I'm going to be kind and we're going to build it on FPGAs. So an FPGA is a field programmable gate array. Uh, so it's programmable hardware. So rather than you wiring up every single wire that you can see on this uh, implementation, uh, it's done electronically for you within a IC. So underneath this LTD display is exactly the same architecture as you saw previously, so a simple CPU running exactly the same code, but it's built on programmable hardware and it will run obviously a lot faster because all the signals now are on the same piece of silicon. Okay, so I have a short video clip of the FPJ implementation of the simple CPU from last year's lecture. Now in this video I refer to the system clock, we'll be looking at that in more detail in later lectures, but for now think about it as a signal that coordinates the actions inside the processor. So you have the program uh, that will print Hello World to the screen, uh, that is broken down into instructions to tell a processor what to do, and those instructions are broken down into micro-instructions, the steps that happen inside the processor. And typically each one of these micro-instructions is triggered by the system clock. As a result, the faster the clock, the more instructions I can process per second, the faster the program will run. So that is now running, uh, because it's running on the chip underneath that, at 100 hertz. So it's faster. And as you've seen, as, as you've probably grown up, computers get faster and faster and faster. So we go, well, we don't want it to run at kind of 1 hertz, let's run it at 100 hertz. Let's run it at 1 kilohertz. Or let's run it at 10 kilohertz. Or we can go to 100 kilohertz. Uh, and I think I don't know if you can kind of see that one. I, as I increase the frequency, eventually I reach a point where it's lost synchronization. So it's no longer printing hello world to the screen, it's printing random garbage. Because uh, technology has a fundamental uh, maximum clock speed. So, like I said with this one here, you don't have to allow enough time for signal to travel down those wires. If you try and clock the processor too fast, if you try to overclock it, eventually. The signals don't get to where they need to get to in time, and the machine crashes. So I slow it back down, and then you see it's crashed horribly because I've clocked it too fast. So if I reset it and run it at the uh, speed that it can communicate with, then the world is good again, and it'll be the hell world. So this is the kind of uh, technology we'll be using in the labs, rather than wiring them up. Right then, so the next question is, how do I actually program uh, this FPGA to become the simple CPU? Uh, and we do that through schematics, so schematic capture. The FPGAs we use are Xilinx based, that's Xilinx as a company who makes the FPGAs, and their software tools are called IRC. And, and within that software, you can draw these schematics. So this here is the implementation of the block diagram we've seen previously. So this block diagram here, with all its communication paths and functional units you see here, and that block diagram is implemented by this schematic you see here. So this is the top level uh, symbol for the simple CPU processor. So you can see I've got our data buses, again our communication paths in and out of the processor. Here's the clock, here's the address bus and some control signals. So inside this symbol is this schematic and this schematic is those functional units. So again we have our uh, accumulator, our ALU, some control logic, uh, our instruction register, our program counter that implements the processor. And, and again, don't worry, we'll be going through all of these in a lot more detail in the later lectures. But we take this schematic, uh, we press uh, the buttons within the IRC tools and that will generate a configuration file. That configuration file is then downloaded across a USB uh, configuration link which configures uh, the FPGA to become the simple CPU uh, to run our software to control the hardware that we want to control. Okay, so now we can draw the schematic, configure the FPGA to become that processor, to become that hardware, but now we need some software to run upon it. Uh, so we'll be implementing in Python uh, a simple assembler and a compiler uh, that will take our high-level language and convert it into the low-level machine code that runs on our 
simple CPU. Now that may sound a bit daunting, but it is a very simple assembler. So it, effectively it's translating the mnemonics that we're using to represent our assembly language, the instructions the process will execute, and it's taking those, that textual representation, and just converting it into a binary string, the ones and zeros that represent the machine code inside the processor that is stored in the instruction memory. In this module, we won't be working at the high level languages that you're used to. We will be working at the assembly language level. And that is so that we can see what's happening inside the processor. Uh, the joy of a high level language is it abstracts away from what is actually happening inside the processor. It hides all that detail. And that's not very useful when you're trying to identify the bottlenecks uh, within the system. You're trying to identify the things that are actually slowing down your processing. So you do really need to work at the, the level that the processor works at, and, and that's the assembly language level. And we'll be going through a series of labs and lectures to teach you those programming skills. So system devices is over the spring and summer term. Uh, normally there's one lecture and one uh, practical per week. Uh, and there's also one workshop where you go through an exercise sheet. Before these, I'd recommend some background reading. Read through the Simple CPU version 1 webpage I showed you previously. Now, I don't expect you to understand all the material on that web page, but just to start to introduce some of the basic concepts to you. Because of COVID, at this time, I don't know if the practicals will actually be in the lab, uh, but I have written an online simulator so you can actually do the labs uh, remotely. Finally, in previous terms, uh, I typically run catch-up sessions just in case people have questions. Again, I'm not sure if these will be in a, in a classroom or whether they'll be online uh, for a Zoom meeting or something equivalent. As you can see from this timetable, the majority of the teaching is done in the spring term. Uh, there are some labs in the summer term. These are optional, uh, allowing you to practice the skills that you've been taught, uh, both in terms of hardware and software. I'd however, I strongly recommend uh, that you do do uh, the summer week one lab, as that prepares you for the open assessment that you'll be doing during the summer term. I've broken the lecture material down into six sections, uh, so those sections are listed here. So the first lecture is what we're doing now, just introducing what's to come. The second lecture set looks at fundamental computer science skills, so uh, number bases, converting between number bases, working in binary, Boolean logic gates, uh, those types of things. Then we start to think about how we can take those basic building blocks and build uh, more complex circuits. So we look how we can take our logic gates and build the fundamental building blocks of our processors. So the multiplexers that route traffic around the processor, encoders and decoders, the arithmetic units, etc. Uh, then we look at memory within the processor. So flip-flops, uh, registers, uh, counters, uh, the things that build the, the state machines that control the execution of our program and how we store those in external memory. Taking these fundamental building blocks, then we start to put them together to build our computers. We start to look at the fetch decode execute cycle, our von Neumann architecture, and see how we can actually program that using assembly language to control some GPO lines in the labs. Then once we've got our basic processor up and running, we start to think about how we can optimize it, how we can make that processor faster, how we can implement our program using less instructions by using more complex instructions, uh, different addressing modes, uh, and, and the such like. To support those lectures, we have a series of labs that gives you a chance to put those skills into practice using the FPGA boards to test out basic logic gates, uh, building more complex gates to implement system functions, uh, then looking at how we can represent data inside our system, how we process it, uh, how we can actually build a state machine that will allow us to process instructions. Then we build and refine the CPU's instruction set, its uh, set of instructions that it can process. And we then implement the simple CPU on the FPGA uh, and then Finally, we do some uh, more complex programming tasks. Uh, we do a little bit of image processing uh, using this processor. As mentioned previously, the simple CPU version 1A's architecture is comparable to a first generation computer. Uh, and a good example of a first generation computer is EDSAC. So this is EDSAC here, and it was made out of valves, first generation machines. So each one of these is a fermionic tube implementing some of the logic gates. Uh, its block diagram is shown here, so again you can see it's, it's kind of similar to the simple CPU. So we've got our memory, we've got the store here, and there we have our general purpose register, the accumulator. It does have some additional registers to do the multiplication, and we have a controller unit there that implements the instruction register and the program counter uh, that allow us to process the instructions. Now compared to a modern processor, this is obviously a very simple architecture, but they do share a common root. They are both stored program machines. They both have the instructions data stored out in external memories. So from one point of view, uh, things haven't changed that much. Uh, both machines process instructions. They still have to perform the fetch decode execute cycle that we'll be looking at in more detail in a later lecture. 
So because of the technology used to implement ATSAC, it pretty much took up a room. Uh, it's a very, very large machine. Uh, it was programmed by a punch tape. So this is what this here is a punch tape reader. So you'd have to go to a room, uh, you'd enter your program and punch it onto a tape, which you could then feed into the punch tape reader, which would load the program into memory and it would execute your program. So quite a labor intensive process compared to modern machines. But again, some things do remain the same. One of my favorite quotes from Morris Wilkes, uh, one of the designers of EDSAC, the difficulty lies not in writing programs, but getting them to work. So he was on a journey between the programming room where you'd punch that tape to EDSAC to execute one of his programs. But he says, hesitating at the angle of stairs, the realization came over me that for a good part of the remainder of my life, I was going to be spending my time finding errors in my own programs. So, Kind of that sinking feeling you get in, the ch in your chest when you realise, oh, what have I done? I've created a monster that I'll <laughs> forever be battling. Uh, and this is true. Finding software bugs is, is a hard thing to do. Uh, therefore, for this module, that's where we're going to have our focus. We're going to focus trying to find bugs. And to visualise a bug, we're going to find Bob. So Bob the bug. And that's because, obviously, as being a computer scientist, we don't like bugs. So to capture Bob, we need a trap. Uh, and this is what we're using in the lab. Uh, so we've got a bug trap, uh, so it's a piece of hardware we can link to the FPGA board and we can control either using hardwired logic circuits or using a processor. So the trap itself has an area here where we capture the bug. We have a bat or a SWAT that we'll capture the bug with. We have two sensors to detect if there's a bug in the trap, so two infrared beams, one at the front, uh, one at the bat. Uh, we have an LED indicator, a toggle switch to switch modes and a red button uh, to either reset the trap or trigger the fire button. As always, I have a website about this, so if you go to my webpage, so it'll talk you through how this bug trap was designed. And at the bottom here, we have some videos of it in action. So the type of programming tasks uh, that you'll have to implement, either in hardware or in software. Here's a video of the trap in action. Initially, we design a hardwired controller out of logic gates to mirror the types of control circuitry we'll find inside the processor. So here we have different modes. So in the manual mode, if I press the red fire button, I close the trap. If I turn it to automatic mode, now the front sensors are triggered. So when the bug enters the trap, he's caught. And if he moves too much, we persuade him not to by repeatedly hitting with the bat. Now we can turn the trap off to release our bug. So over a series of labs, we will incrementally refine our, our trap, adding more behaviors. Uh, replacing the hardwired control logic with a, a processor, allowing us to control the trap in software. And this links into another famous quote, build a better mousetrap and the world will beat a path to your door. This is the same for processors. So you, if you look back over history, you'll see how the processes have evolved over time, incrementally being refined to improve their behaviours for particular tasks, especially in the desktop market. So you, so you started out with your basic computer, your basic mousetrap, and over time, it's incrementally refined. And it's a, you identify what functions does it need to perform, what optimizations does it need to have. So you can see here we're moved over to a peg style mousetrap, which is a lot easier to set and less dangerous to your fingers. But not all improvements are, uh, are a good idea. So uh, this is a real mousetrap, if you can call it that. Uh, so it's obviously an, uh, an old-fashioned uh, revolver. Uh, so the mouse would pull the bait and uh, the gun would go off, which is obviously not a really good idea. And if you look at some of the techniques used in uh, processor evolution, again, there's some not good ideas in there. We'll be looking at a few of those uh, as we go through. So we start off with the, with the simple CPU version 1A, and it has, as, as I said previously, some limitations. And to get over those limitations, we use self-modifying code. So we use a program that rewrites itself as it executes. So a pro program that modifies its behavior, which is obviously a, a not a good idea, but it does overcome some of the limitations uh, in the simple CPU's architecture. But we later obviously replace those uh, software techniques with uh, dedicated hardware to allow us to execute the types of programs to perform the types of function we want to perform uh, in our computer. Now, I want to be fair. So obviously with the bug trap, we've kind of got a one-sided battle here. So to counter the bug trap, uh, I'll, we're going to make the bug uh, a suit of armour. So if you play Heroes or uh, Blizzard games, uh, you'll recognise Diva's mech here. Uh, I play HOTS, uh, so Heroes of the Storm. So if, so if you ever see anyone in a game with the Blizzard tag Aviator, then it's compulsory to comment on how good a player he is uh, and not kill him in the, in the game. So we're going to mirror Diva's mech and build a robot. So in the workshops that we have each week, 
the second part of those workshops will go through and incrementally build this robot, which you can then build yourself if you want to make your own version. So in weeks 8 to 10 of the summer term, after the exams are finished, so you can take the designs you've built in the workshops and build your own robot and give them some behaviours. So this one here, the robot cockroach, he's got two wheels that allows him to wander around uh, his environment. He's got a, a basic eye here, so with four sensors, so he can tell the direction of light and move towards it, and two very simple bump sensors, so he can interact with his environment. As always, I have a video of the robot in action. This particular version doesn't have the composite eye, but it has uh, random movement and bump sensors. So we'll start them off. So it performs a search pattern, some random movements. And when it hits an obstacle, it will reverse and turn around. And start off its search pattern again, its random movements. And it will explore its environment, as you can see here. The leg wheels aren't the quality. So in developing our better bug trap, we're going to mirror the development cycle that Intel took uh, when they developed their first processor. So this is the uh, Intel 4004 or 4004, so that's the, the, the processor here, and it is a silicon die shot. So you can see a rough outline of the transistors used in it. So it used about 2000 transistors running at about 700 kilohertz. So quite slow compared to a modern processor, but it did actually have a little bit more functionality than the simple CPU version 1A uh, that we're starting off with. So back in the day, in the 1970s, in Intel was actually a small company uh, focusing on memory IC, so it was developing DRAM chips. To supplement this income, they took on custom IC work. So a Japanese company approached them about developing uh, a set of ICs, so application-specific uh, integrated circuits, or ASICs, uh, for their desktop calculator, as you can see in this picture. So originally the design specs asked for three ASICs, uh, one to do the keyboard interfacing, one to do the processing, so your add, subtract, multiply, divide, whatever it may be, and one chip to handle uh, the paper printer at the top here. As Intel was quite a small company, they only actually had two design engineers working on these ASICs. Uh, later, a third member joined the team to help them out from the actual customer, but there wasn't actually enough manpower to design all three chips in time. So they went to plan B. So rather than designing three separate chips, they decided to design one chipset that could be reprogrammed in software to emulate the three different functionalities. And that's what they came up with, the, the first commercial microprocessor. There had been a couple of microprocessors before the, the Intel 4004, but these, these were military ones, not commercial ones. So this is the actual processor. So it's a small 16-pin chip, uh, a 4-bit processor. Obviously, it needs some memory, so we've got some uh, RAM chips and ROM chips. And to interface to the real world, it had some GPIO chips as well to allow it to control those lines to emulate the functionality that the keyboard controller or the processing elements or the printer chip would have performed. So that's what we're going to do with our bug trap. So in the FPGA, so that's the FPGA board at the top here, so this chip here, we can reconfigure to be different hardware circuits. So to start off with, uh, our bug traps could be hardwired, so it's going to have some basic functionality as we saw in the video. So if the bug comes in the trap, it'll automatically trip the sensors and close the trap. But then we want to add some behavior, some perhaps some time delays or some different functionalities depending on if it's morning or night. So we need a real time clock and we could implement that in hardware, but it would be quite complex to do. And it wouldn't be very flexible. You couldn't easily adjust it because it's all dedicated hardware. So we're going to move over to a processor. So we're going to use a processor with some general purpose input output lines, some GPIO to control the bug trap and then program the functionality in software. Unfortunately, if you want to buy your own bug traps, they're a little bit on the expensive side. Uh, the actual hardware here, if you do any hobbyist electronics, you'll, you'll recognize these are kind of Arduino type components. It's only about 10 quid's worth of components in the actual bug trap. Uh, but the FPJ board is about £100. Uh, and then the interface boards here is around about 100 again. So you're looking about 250 quid all in. Uh, so it's a little bit on the expensive side. But if you want to make your own bug trap and then control that with a Raspberry Pi or Arduino, uh, again, go to the web page and you can download the designs for free. So over Series Labs, we could continue to develop the bug trap. But as we all know, computers were really designed to play games. And that's the last thing we do do. So using our simple CPU, we implement a bug game. Uh, it may look like Pong, but it's not. It's a bug game. Uh, you're obviously hitting a small green bug over a river between two bats. So we again implement that on the simple CPU running on our FPJ. And we squirt out ASCII characters to a computer and display the game actually on a PC via a terminal program. Again, during the summer term, week eight to 10 activities, 
Uh, you can build this games machine yourself if you want to. Uh, so I've ported this design over to a cheaper FPGA board and you can buy some of these cheap, cheaper ones for around about £25 each. So if you want to build your own bug game, that's a possibility. Okay, moving on to the assessment, the bit you've been waiting for. So the assessment runs in summer term weeks one to four. As I said at the beginning, this module focuses on skills. So, so over the series of lectures and labs that we do do, you will get the skills you need to build your own processor and write your own assembler. And you take those skills and what you have to do is then apply those to a particular problem. So I'll start a set a task. And that task will be basic image processing. So you've got a picture of a bug and you have to do some processing on it. So you can see here, as an example, we've taken our original color image and then wrote a program uh, to separate out the red, the green and the blue components of that image. So you also will be given a description of what you need to do and you will have to write a solution using the simple CPU process to solve that problem. Marks will be awarded for functionality for correctness, but also for speed. So the quicker you can process the image, the more marks you will get. So the faster, the better. Now you can solve this problem without adding any additional instructions or hardware to your processor, but it won't be particularly fast. Therefore, to achieve maximum marks in the assessment, you will need to modify the processor, add additional instructions, add additional hardware elements in order to improve the processing performance of your system. So it's just to finish off, these are the learning outcomes for the modules as described in the module descriptor. And if you go through these, you can see through the journey of building our better bug trap, we'll cover all these learning outcomes. So identifying the components that build up our computer systems, the processor memories and buses, the data types we're processing, functions that will be formed, how these system blocks are made from transistors and logic gates, implementing our store program computer, our simple CPU processor, and identifying its limitations, describing how our bug traps functionality can be implemented in software, how we generate that software using various tool chains, our assembler compilers and linkers, etc., and interface those to the real world uh, to do our processing jobs. So fingers crossed everyone will find this an easy and an enjoyable module. As always, if you have any questions, don't be shy, do come and see me.